Well, good morning, Wesley family, and welcome to worship uh, on this first Sunday in March, Uh, and uh, we are glad to have you with us. I just want to make a few announcements. First of all, if you are worshiping with us on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, once again, welcome. We'd also ask that you go ahead and interact uh, with one another, uh, like, comment, and share uh, the video. We also are wanting to publicize our blessing box that we share with the Presbyterian Church. Uh, That's in dire need right now, and so if you have items that you'd like to bring by, food or hygiene, personal care items uh, that you'd like to bring by, we would be glad to have those. Just stop by the office and drop those off. Uh, We are uh, still in our creed study, and we are, of course, I hope that you're following along in the Uh, in the devotional guide uh, during the week. I'd also like to invite you to join us for one of our small group discussions. Uh, There's an in-person group on Wednesday at 6 o'clock here at the church, Wednesday evening. Uh, There's a Zoom virtual group at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings, and then there's an in-person group also on Thursday mornings at 9.15. We hope that you'll join us at any one of those. And then finally, just a reminder to continue to support your church. You've all been so wonderful and so generous. Uh, You can send those donations in or you can give online at wesleyonline.org slash give. And uh, I hope that all of you got your newsletter by now. Uh, Those have been out uh, and hope that you're following along with all that's going on here at Wesley uh, as we uh, continue through the season of Lent. Thank you. 
Satan's written face a frowning world. And face a frowning world. And face a frowning world. Then I can smile at Satan's written face a frowning world. Let his eye go delusion, as long as a sorrow of a I invite you now to join me in the opening prayer. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, that we may become instruments of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Virgin Mary had a baby born. The Virgin Mary had a baby born. The Virgin Mary had a baby born. And they say that his name is Jesus. Wise men came 
came where the baby was born. The wise men came where the baby was born. The wise men came where the baby was born. And they say that his name is Jesus. He come from the glory. He come from the glorious kingdom. He come from the glory. He come from the glorious kingdom. Oh yes, believer. Oh yes, believer. He come from the glory. He come from the glorious kingdom. week we talked about Jesus as Lord. Lord Farquaad. <laughs> we, we compared him to Lord Farquaad. So we talked a lot about his power and how he um, had a lot of control and we were to worship him and bow down to him and we kind of got that feeling of how um, how holy and powerful and um, and how we're to listen to him. We talked a lot about that, right? Mm-hmm. So this week when we talk about the creed, um, we're talking about the phrase that says that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. So this is a different side of Jesus. This is a side of Jesus where we see just how human Jesus is. I'm going to describe something for you, and I want you to try and guess what I'm describing. Okay. Okay? So, the th- um, this is a creature. Okay. And is it like an animal? It's a creature. And it's small. And it has antenna. An ant? An ant? It is an ant. You're a good guesser. I didn't even have to give her all the clues. I am talking about an ant. So I want you to think for a minute, you to think for a minute, and you to think for a minute. Um, Let's say that you loved ants, like thought they were so cool and you wanted to care for them and you were so, so careful when you were walking outside that you didn't step on them and that, and you would like leave food for them. Maybe like some of that um, sandwich crust that you didn't want to eat, you would leave. So you knew the little ants would have something to eat and you just loved them so much. But you didn't, you weren't able to tell them how much you love them. Because even if you got down on your belly on the ground and you looked at them in their little ant eyes and you told them how much you loved them, do you think they would understand you? No. Do you think maybe they would be terrified? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So let's say that the only way that you could communicate with the ants, that you could have them understand you, is that you become an ant yourself. What you want is to talk with them. You want them to understand how much you love them, how much you care for them, and you want to help keep them safe, and you want to protect them, and you want them to listen to you. But when you're a big human, they're terrified of you, that you're going to squash them, right? And they don't understand you because you speak English and I'm pretty sure they don't, right? They speak ant. So the only solution is for you to become one of them, which is exactly what God did when he, we talked about, about how almighty God is. But even as mighty as God is, he sent his son Jesus to us. And he didn't send Jesus as this big, powerful, superhero kind of a man. How did Jesus come to us? As a human. As a human. And how did he first come to us? As a baby. As a baby. As a small, not very powerful baby. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot like that ant illustration, right? So God, this infinite creator that we've talked about, this powerful being that we've talked about, came to us as a human. And he grew with us as a baby. He grew with us in knowledge. He helped us to understand. He taught us. He loved us as only another human, as only we can understand human to human. We can connect with him. Jesus went through the same struggles as a human as we go through as a human, right? If, we, if, Jesus, if God hadn't done that, if God hadn't sent Jesus to us as a human, 
then we might be able to say, you have no idea what it's like, right? Have you ever thought about that when dad and I tell you something? Oh, you just don't understand, right? Except how many times have dad and I told you, oh, we completely understand because we were once your age, right? Jesus was us. Jesus was a human. He understands the struggles that we go through as a human. He can connect with us and we can connect with him, right? So Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully human. And that's a really important part of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Dear Lord, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for sending your son. Jesus. Jesus. To our earth. To our earth. To show us how much you love us. To show us how much you love us. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week, and we'll catch you again next week. Next week. Bye. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we are continuing our series on the Apostles' Creed with the phrases, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Uh, these phrases deal with the incarnation and passion of Jesus. And so first we're going to uh, look at the incarnation. Last week we uh, looked at who Jesus was, and so this week we're going to continue uh, the conversation of who Jesus was, and then we're going to move on to uh, what Jesus did. And so last week we looked at Jesus' divinity, we looked at his godness, we looked at the fact that he was the Son of God, we uh, set forth that he is the Son of God, he is the Savior of the world, and he is the Lord of us all. And that we can't get around that, that he is preexistent and that he is uh, preeminent. Uh, but now we're going to shift and look at Jesus' humanity. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He, he is fully God, as we learned last week, and he is fully human. Now, Right here, we, we've stumbled upon this thing of the virgin birth, and uh, sometimes that is, well, it is hard for us to get our heads around uh, because you would say that that's impossible, and you are correct. It is not possible. That's why it's called a miracle. Uh, you can say the same thing about creation. You can look in Genesis and say, um, well, uh, God created the universe in six days. That's impossible. You're correct. It is impossible. That's why it's called a miracle. You can look at the resurrection of Jesus and say, that's impossible, and you're right. It's not possible. That's why it's called a miracle. In order to be a Christian believer in order to recite the creed with any kind of integrity, in order to be able to stand in church and say the creed with the church with, without having your fingers crossed, you have to believe in miracles. You have to have, in addition to a natural worldview, we do live in a natural world. There is a, such a thing as science. We can use science to figure some things out, but you have to also have a supernatural worldview. You have to simply believe that there are some things that while they're, they are very real, they don't fit within our natural scientific worldview. And so you have to believe in things like God and the Trinity and creation and virgin birth and in resurrection and uh, the church is oftentimes uh, attempted throughout the centuries to demystify the faith because uh, people were having a hard time with these miracle stories and the church was trying to say things, well, it's okay, you don't have to believe in, in miracles, but what we found very quickly is that when we did that, the whole thing fell apart. And so I am a believer 
in miracles. I believe that God did the miracles that he that the Bible says he did, and I believe that God is still doing miracles today, things that our science cannot explain. Virgin birth being a prime example. But it was necessary that Jesus be born of a virgin for a couple of reasons. First of all, to fulfill the prophecy of the Old Testament, Isaiah 7:14 says the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel. That means God with us. That's who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus also had to be born of a virgin so that he did not inherit our original sin, so that he was born and lived a sinless life. See, we tend to think of of there was this guy named Jesus. This is the way some people would teach it. There was this guy named Jesus, and he was a regular guy like you and me, and he was really good, and he became the Son of God. That's exactly backwards. There was a Son of God, and he became a human being. John 1.14 says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And he came to share our humanity, to experience our life. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So he came to live a human life. He came to live a human life so that he could take on our sins, so that he could be an example and a sacrifice for us. Last week I read from uh, Philippians 2, beginning at verse 10, about how every knee will bow and every tongue conf- will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I want to read to you now uh, from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death. On a cross. And that brings us to our next topic for today Jesus' passion, his suffering. The Creed tells us that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. The, in in our, our section of the Creed today, we see the only two human beings in the Creed mentioned by name. Number one was virgin, the Virgin Mary for her obedience and willingness, and the other one is Pontius Pilate for the part he played in Jesus' death. Pontius Pilate, if you know the Easter story, was the Roman governor of the province of Judea and ruled on behalf of the Roman Empire in that area. It's interesting that the the creed mentions Pontius Pilate by name (coughs) for two reasons, excuse me, for two reasons. First of all, there's a historical reason. To say that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate (coughs) is to place these events in a particular time and place in history, right? We are not talking about once upon a time. We are not talking about long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. We are talking about a moment in history at a place that you can still go to today. Because Pontius Pilate is named, we can place the events of Jesus' life to the period between 26 and 36 AD in Jerusalem where Pontius Pilate was in power. And so the creed dates itself. It says right now is when these things happened. We're not making this up. We can tell you the day. We can tell you the people who were there. 
So far in the creed, we have made assertions of faith based on Scripture, and there's no getting around that. The, the very word creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. But this phrase, however, is a verifiable secular historical fact. There was a Roman governor in Judea named Pontius Pilate, and he crucified a man named Jesus of Nazareth. That's secular, verifiable history. But the other reason why Pontius Pilate is mentioned by name is when this, when the Apostles' Creed first began being used as the baptismal creed for the early church in the third century, that is in the years that start with 200, Christianity was still an illegal and persecuted religion within the Roman Empire. It was illegal to be a Christian. If you were a Christian, the empire would come and drag you out of your home and feed you to lions. Uh, and so to make the newly baptized lay the crucifixion of Jesus at the feet of the Roman Empire in the person of Pontius Pilate was to the Romans treason, but for the Christians an important statement of faith distinguishing the church from the empire. We're told that Jesus was crucified, a popular Roman method of execution, especially for troublemakers like Jesus, that he died, that's the result of crucifixion. People didn't survive crucifixion. The Romans were very good at what they did, and that he was buried. He was laid in a tomb. And often we might ask ourselves, what, what's the most important thing? What's the, what's the most important thing in the Bible? What is the center of the center of the center of the gospel? In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, Paul writes, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, the most important thing, listen up, I'm about to tell you, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried and that He was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that is where we will pick up next week. Let us pray. Dear God, we, we thank you again for the creed. And we thank you uh, for its, its conciseness, its brevity, but also its completeness. Uh, that it, it bases itself in history even while it claims faith. God, we thank you for Jesus, that he, he came down from heaven, that he became a human being for us, that he lived like us so that he can empathize with us, so that he can be an example for us, and so that he could die on our behalf to pay the penalty for our sins. God, we pray for this church. We pray that you'd bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, we pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray for the United Methodist Church. We pray for this annual conference in our Bishop Lori, this district, and our Superintendent Doug. We pray for our community, our nation, and our world in these troubled times. God, we pray for all the people and the places of the world who are in need today. God, we pray for an end to this coronavirus pandemic and the restoration of our communities. God, we pray for political and social and racial and spiritual healing in our country. We pray for the men and women who serve us at home and abroad. We pray for our military and for our veterans, for our first responders and our law enforcement, for our health care workers and all the essential workers that serve our communities. 
God, we pray for our world leaders at every level. We pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and the whole world, the blessings of peace, justice, health, safety, freedom, stability, prosperity, and holiness. And God, we pray that you would hear us now from wherever we are as we lift up our prayers to you, either silently or aloud, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, you have heard our prayers here this morning, and you hear the prayers that remain silent upon our hearts. Oh God, you know our every need, and when we do not know how to pray, your Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And God, we pray that you would hear us as we lift our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now if, you would, if it's something that you can do where you are, if you'd stand and join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, I'd like to welcome you to our, our communion, our virtual communion service uh, for this Sunday. Uh, I'm going to be uh, leading us in the confession and the great thanksgiving, and then leading us also in the prayer for spiritual communion. As you participate in that prayer, you're receiving all the spiritual benefits of communion, even if you can't uh, physically receive the elements. Uh, but having said that, um, I would like to say that if you would like to receive, if you would like to be served the elements, please contact me and we will, we will make that happen safely for you uh, if we can. I'm, I'm willing to do that. And so please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, but for this morning, I invite you to participate in, in spiritual communion uh, this morning. Dear friends, the United Methodist Church practices open communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who truly love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins, and all who seek to live in peace with one another. And young children are welcome to participate at the discretion of their parents. Therefore, let us prepare ourselves to receive this holy sacrament by confessing and repenting of our sins. If you would join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love 
toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. By Your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through Your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in Your holy church, all honor and glory is Yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would you join me, please, in the prayer for spiritual communion? My Jesus, I love you above all things. How I long to receive you with my brothers and sisters at the table you have prepared. Since I cannot at this moment receive you in bread and wine according to your promise in the sacrament of Holy Communion, I ask you to feed me with the manna of your Holy Spirit and nourish me with your holy presence. I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from your love. Amen.
Receive this benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Let us go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ, experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love. Amen.